What's up, Connection? Welcome into the Wrestling Warzone, a Monday Night Wars podcast retrospective series. I am JT, and joining me as ever is my partner, Chad. And of course, we are simulcast on both YouTube on video and audio on all podcast applications. Be sure to subscribe to both so you don't miss a thing. And check us out across all social media. Currently, Ryan Graham, myself, ranking all 402 WrestleMania matches all time, counting down to this year's WrestleMania. Those are posted on YouTube Shorts, TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook Reels. They're all one minute or less, and we are moving our way through them. It's quite the project, Chad. Yeah, what, but, uh, what around four or five a day, right? Every day till yeah. Mania. Yeah. So check them out. Weigh in. Share your thoughts. There, there are those that are in there every day pissing and moaning or saying good job. So be sure to join the masses in checking out our all-time ranking and share yours as well. All right, Chad. On this show, we're here every other Monday. Going through the Monday Night Wars, we started in September 1995, of course, so here we are in March of 1997. The uh, powder keg has been lit. The fire is burning strong in the Monday Night Wars, and tonight we are WCW only. Yeah, we are uh, doing Uncensored 97, a show I was really looking forward to. Uh, not a show I've watched a ton, and uh, I remember liking at least some of the big moments that happens on this show. Uh, but I was interested to rewatch the whole show, uh, especially with the confines of the, I guess, overall pod and the stuff we've been watching. Because definitely on this kind of chronological walkthrough, we've discussed that this is uh, probably the worst book or worst build into a pay per view they've had since the NWO. Um, which which I think is kind of a little bit of an upset. I think some people may think like with the Piper Alcatraz stuff, you might you might think it would be Super Brawl, but I, I think top to bottom, this has been uh, easily the most shaky stuff, even including the main event. So I was, I was really excited to watch the show to see what happened and whether that hindered my enjoyment or not. No, me too. Um, and I, I think one thing we've had consistently since June – of 96 with WCW is there's a baseline uh, for their pay-per-view. It's like, yeah, there's been some great all timers, but their baseline is pretty high. Like I don't, have we had a pay-per-view below a seven? Since uh, the started? Yeah. I mean, like, I don't, I can't sold out. We didn't like sold quarter. out. Well, sold out since old thing, but like hog wild. And I feel like um, we still kind of like low key. Like yeah. I mean, show. hog wild, I would still say is like a borderline good show. Um, and then World War Three is not like a great show, but it's it's still good to very good too. Like Hog Wild, I gave a seven and a half. Fall Brawl was an eight and a half. Yeah, Fall Halloween Brawl Havoc was, was a seven. Yep. World War Three six and a half. Yep. Starcade eight and a half. Yep. I mean, sold out sucked, but Super Brawl we like seven. So I, I mean, we've had yep. take sold out of the mix for me. Every pay per view has been six and a half and up. Uh, yeah, since, yeah, since June. Yeah, there's definitely, <clears throat> I mean, and mixed in with there, um, between Great American Bash, Bash at the Beach, Fall Brawl, and Starcade, like for me, those four are like great, great shows. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd say besides Sold Out, it's been, I mean, we've talked about it, it's been an amazing run. Like Sold Out kind of in the streak of all great, all good to great yeah, shows, yeah. but. They've still they kind of bounced back a little bit. I mean, Super Brawl was like a very good, solid show. Nothing groundbreaking, not amazing, but for what you were getting on pay per view, kind of in that time frame, like it's a good show. So I mean, if this hits, we're we're at nine out of ten, like very good pay per views. Yes, uh, nine yes. out of the last ten. <laughs> Slambery sucks. Um, before we got the hot streak going. Yes. Yes. So yeah, we'll see. Really, since the NWO, I mean, you could say since the NWO angle. Yeah. My my hit. my memory tells me, like we don't have we don't have another bad one for a bit here. So we'll we'll see if that holds. But right, yeah, yeah. I'm oh, interested no. to get to the first one that is. Well, I think I know which one. <laughs> but, but we're, yeah, yeah. My inkling is uh, we're still going to be to about Starcade till another yep. like real stinker. Yeah. So we'll see. That's my guess. Um, all right, any uh, news or notes you want to get into before we dive no, in? No, I think we talked about most of the big developments with Rodman on the last show. Yeah. Uh, because that was both the observers and torch that recapped last week and were leading up to the pay per view. So, so we don't have much till the actual 
uh, pay-per-view coverage from both of them. Um, so, so we can get right in. Uh, we are uncensored. 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 Uh, it's from Charleston, South Carolina. I always, always think that's a little bit of a weird spot. Yeah. But they're we're we're gonna see. They, I mean, they're still running kind of weird spots on pay per view. I don't even know where, like, because I've been to Charleston. I don't. I didn't even notice like that. There was like some kind of arena there. I guess. I guess. Yeah. Was. I was riding go near. Yeah. Us, um and uh, very generic opening again. We talked about it. This one's about as generic as you can get. Just running down the card. So. This is the one space WCW to me is still severely lacking. And even when WWF has been down. Their video packages, their opens are still solid. They're about to get really good. WCW, that's one area to me that's still kind of weak is their hype videos um, and their opening pay-per-view videos. And again, it's not the most important thing, but it, it, it could, it's like one thing that prevents them from feeling like Super Major League. Everything else, the production of the show is great, yeah. uh, especially on Nitro. It looks crisp and live and, and awesome. But these video packages feel so, even for the time, they just feel like rudimentary. Right. Yeah, yeah, this is uh, as generic as you can get. Uh, we get some pyro go into our usual pay per view announce team, which is Tony, Bobby, and Dusty. Uh, they try to run down all the steps for this convoluted main event. So, so we we learn thirty six months and the belts back if the NWO loses. Bobby lets us know the NWO's back is against the wall, but we're robbing in the building. Who knows what will happen? Um, so, so they kind of give a little bit of the lay of the land, uh, before we go to our first match. Um, and this was a very anticipated match for me. Dean Malenko versus Eddie Guerrero for the U S championship, no disqualification match. Um, and then watching this, I may have more notes on this match than any match we <laughs> we talked about. I had a lot of notes here, so we'll get into it. Uh, Dusty talks about both guys becoming more aggressive uh, he does bring up Eddie breaking the rules, but he says, hey, rules sometimes need to be broken. Uh, Bobby says Eddie's a backstabber. Personally, I wouldn't trust the guy. So we get Bobby's stance right away. Uh, Randy Anderson's the referee here, so he's back full-fledged on this show. Uh, he, he refs a few matches yep. throughout the night here. Um, so he, he's just back as one of the guys now. Uh, Dean shoves him down. They fire away and they intensely go after it. Shoulder thrust and a taunt from Eddie, uh, along with some big punches. Dean responds with a shoulder block and Eddie bails to the outside. Dean gets him in the corner, stomps him down, hits a nice su suplex, and uh, then also talks trash and slaps Eddie, kind of like how Eddie was hovering over him uh, earlier. Eddie responds to some kicks and then is actually getting booed from the crowd. I'd say Dean's kind of the crowd favorite here. Yeah, I would agree, definitely. Uh, Eddie gets sent to the turnbuckle and the back suplex. Uh, Tony lets us know. there's To the back, there's some commotion in the back locker room. Bobby, here we go. Uh, so we go to the back, and we see someone kind of face down. And uh, it's a little... The way it was filmed, it's kind of like, who is that? And then they kind of say, oh, that kind of looked like Rick Steiner as they go back to the match itself. Then they get, you know, like in 30 seconds, a confirmation to say, well, we just heard that was Rick Steiner that was beaten down. And like the NWO, so so when they go to the back, they show Rick Steiner face down and the NWO is kind of off to the side taunting and you know, oh, what have you know, so whatever. So, you, it's, it's real like, funny. They're like, oh, the Steiners have been having some bad luck lately. <laughs> yeah, bad luck. He's like, get some help out here. Yes, yes. Uh, so back to the match, Dean starts working over uh, Eddie's leg, and he also grabs the belt and uses it to kind of bring into the no DQ stipulation. Eddie turns the momentum on the side suplex. Eddie rakes the eyes with the boots. He drop kicks the knee. Uh, a really cool move where Eddie springboards from the ring to the outside onto Dean's knee that was kind of dangling on the outside. Uh, that that move needs to be lifted today. Like, you never mm -hmm. see that. Like, Dean, it was just, it was one of those that really utilized ring positioning and yeah. felt kind of like a spontaneous thing that uh, Eddie did. But looked awesome. It made psychologically was, you know, a great additive to the match. It was excellent. 
uh, axe handle to the leg, which was also cool. So really honing in on the leg here of Dean. STL, which is a move they hadn't done much. Uh, then they go to the back. They do show an ambulance taking Rick to the hospital. NWO still there clowning him. Uh, Hall says he's got a history. History is a troublemaker. Yeah, Hall says he has a history as a troublemaker. <laughs> Um, so so there we go. It looks did like you get the other line he said, uh, "No, I did not." He get goes, the uh, "Don't forget your hat." <laughs> He's leaving. <laughs> uh, so so it looks like Rick won't be able to join us for the main event. Uh, Dean uh, tries to roll out to the outside, but Eddie follows him up on the floor, sends Dean into the guardrail. Uh, a really cool variation where Eddie gives a, a drop kick. Uh, on the knee that's wrapped around the post. He doesn't just like slam the leg on the post. He actually gives a drop kick to do that. Uh, Bobby says he doesn't think Rick will be back. So, th- so there we go. They're already calling. He's going to be done. He's, he's done. Done he's for done. the night. Uh, figure four from Eddie, and he uses the ropes for leverage. Yes. <laughs> and uh, when he's using the ropes for leverage on the figure four, Tony lets us know. I mean, it's no DQ, mm-hmm. but... This again, this is where this stipulation to me really works because it's like, well, Eddie's not breaking the rules here, but right. he's definitely taking a shortcut. Like, he's not doing yeah. the in the confines of this match, he's not breaking the rules, but he's also not being much of a man of honor. Um, and he and plus he's clowning Dean saying he's going to break Dean's leg. Uh, Dean breaks out of the figure four with a thumb to the eye. Some nasty European uppercuts from Eddie. Big slide and dive, uh, which Dean moves from. Eddie goes crashing into the guardrail rib first. Dean lifts Eddie up and drops him over the railing. Uh, and and this, so so I think this match is an incredible Eddie Guerrero performance. Mm-hmm. And um, there was a couple moments here right when they transitioned where Eddie crashed into the guardrail and Dean kind of starts working over just the arm and Eddie positions himself with Dean's blows that it hits kind of the, the uh, tricep kind of pectoral region. So it still brings in where he crashed into the guardrail. Right. right. Like, like he kind of modifies what the, uh, point of attack is based on that it, it was just it was very good thinking on his part uh so big power bomb gets two uh standing switch dean gets a low blow uh eddie gets another low blow super quick which was like a lucha foul fashion that they do in lucha all the time like like just a, a insanely fast kick as a low blow and rolls him up for two. That was a great near fall. Snout power slam by Dean. He goes to the top, which Tony mentions is uncharacteristic for him. And uh, he actually pulls off the frog splash uh, and pulls Eddie up at a two count. So, mm-hmm. so this is uh, again, one of the, <clears throat> this is one of the first instances I can think of in WCW, WWF where they're like stealing each other's finishers Right. As a uh, kind of point of contention. Uh, Bobby says it was a mistake to pull Eddie up on the count. Dean goes for the power bomb. Eddie flips him over with the Rana. Some more reversals and pinfall. A good reversal and a big German suplex. Eddie then locks in the clover leaf. As this goes on, six comes out and uh, steals the U.S. belt. That gets Eddie pissed off. He breaks the clover leaf, has a tug of war with six over the belt. And while all that jostling's going uh, on, Six kind of, he had his video camera with him. That goes into the ring. Dean grabs the video camera, smashes Eddie Guerrero with it, and picks up the win. Um, so so this is a match, you know, this is a feud I've loved. Uh, and this this ended up being a match I loved. I thought the uh, psychology was spot on. I thought they utilized a stipulation like when you think no disqualification, you really think like in maybe an out of control brawl or something with weapons. Um, you didn't get that here, but you had enough moments where it would have been a disqualification in other matches between the finish, the low blows, the using of the ropes uh, on the submission moves that shows like both of these guys are 
starting to hate. I mean, they're hating each other. They're yeah, bro- especially Malenko. He really hates Eddie. Yes, and it's like, well, who's in the right? We still don't know, and that's what I love. Like this match kept adding intrigue to this overall story where, you know, is Dean accurate and in the right in his hatred of Eddie? Um, And as I said, I thought Eddie was like a tour de force in this match where he was able to utilize his ring smarts, uh, one, to target Dean's leg and also to uh, get some good work with his ribs and his upper body when he gets worked over and to also uh, utilize some Lucha shortcuts from his upbringing um, to help emphasize the match. There, there. I mean, I, on, this is this is definitely a, a Chad-type match that I think is one where if you just have it on the background, it, it can kind of get lost um, because I, I, I don't think it's as dynamic as their 1995, like from a match standpoint, you know, it's not as... Um, Toes and near falls, turns to high spots, etc. Uh, but I thought it was a really good, like, thinking man's match. Um, maybe minor stuff that honestly prevents this from starting to flirt with, like, some of the best matches we've seen on this podcast for me. Like, with Dean with the leg selling, he kind of blows that off by the end a little bit. Uh, but overall, I, I think it's a great match. I went four and a quarter. Yeah, I mean, and, and the story's been really good, like you said, and I like too that Eddie's turn has been very organic. Um, it hasn't felt like oh, just a sudden turn. He just snapped. He's just kind of getting more aggravated. He got screwed over by the NWO a bunch of times. He's feeling frustrated. It's a little bit in his family, right? That uh, wrestle a little bit more aggressively and maybe take some cheap, uh, some shortcuts here and there. Yeah. And Dean's just straight up calling him out on it. He's like, you know, me and you, we're we were we go way back. And now look at look what you're starting to do, right? Instead of being a straight up wrestler, you're starting to do this these shortcuts. Um, so I like this choice as an opener because it has a story, but it also has the ring work um, where they can engage the crowd because of the story that's inside of it. And not just, you know, we've seen these type of matches struggle sometimes with, with these WCW crowds. It's mainly more than Benoit than Eddie and Dean, but we have seen it at times. Um, I like it dispersing the Rick stuff right out of the gate because we set up the, the through line for the night and it didn't, it wasn't too intrusive on the match. It was just like kind of quick. It didn't overtake. They, we, we didn't get a split screen for like freaking five minutes like we get sometimes. So they just kind of went to it and came back. Uh, D- Dusty said, he's ragging him when Dean is uh, gets a nasty pop-up German on Eddie. Eddie had a really nice, that snap power bomb was really cool. And then I'm glad Dean won even after he picked him up because I, I really, it may be the ECW watching I've been doing a lot of, but I really um, hate the pull-up thing like yeah. scorpio you did it all the time in ecw drives me nuts so i was glad he won anyway and it wasn't like a bullshit fake finish or uh whatever visual finish right so i thought the ending was fine you know six has been a big part of this feud so to have him out there screwing both guys again dean now cheats after all the shit talking he did to eddie um he uses the camera so he doesn't really have as much high ground anymore so it was a great opener a lot of nuance uh, heavy offense for both they got a lot of time um you know the turn uh, an attitude from Eddie was a breath of fresh air for sure. Uh, using the match tip to nudge him heel was smart, like we said. And we'll see if it continues. It's been great for the U.S. division. Dean could have had the win and the belt, wanted to punish him more, and then the sixth stuff is kind of whatever. So uh, not needed, didn't hurt things too much, but it makes sense within the uh, story. So very strong stuff. I went three and three quarters. Uh, not quite as high as you, but I did like it. I did like it a lot. Uh, Gene <clears throat> gives us the hotline scoop, says there's a WCW superstar who's gone history and why. Um, I haven't read the Observer or Torch yet to see who he's talking. Who do you think he's talking about here? I'll I'm pretty it. sure it's Disco. Yeah, um, it's got to be Disco because we yeah. talked about he was fired. That was already in the Observer. So um, it's got to be that for refusing to be to uh, yep. Jackie. Yeah, yeah got to be Disco Inferno. And they probably even buried him and said he was scared of Jack one. Uh, yeah, if he called the sure. hotline, yeah, so he'll uh, be back three. eventually. We'll talk about it. he is rumored to jump for quite for a little bit. We'll get to that yeah. in a month or so on the WF side. Um, but I it's, think he's back, is it like August or so? He comes back, maybe somewhere in there. Maybe it's actually an interesting time for him to get released with what's going on with WWF. Yeah. I mean, it seemed like a natural yeah. fit. It was almost somebody. yeah, yeah, almost just expecting it. It was like, all right, yeah, he's, he's definitely gonna go there. Why not? It's, it's a perfect yeah. fit. I think, ironically, when he comes back. 
part of the stipulation to come back is he does have to, he does job to Jackie. I think oh, they yeah. still go through with it. They make oh, it yeah. happen as part of his comeback. So I want to say it's like late summer. He's back, but yeah. Uh, I'm assuming that's who this is. I don't, I don't yeah, know. Who else it, yeah. Yeah. It's gotta be him. Uh, he also does a rundown of the uncensored card. Then he brings in Roddy Piper. <clears throat> um, Craig, <clears throat> crazy Piper promo here. Uh, he says he doesn't need all this to get them into a cage. Talking about Hogan and the stipulation. He has metal in his hip. He mentions Queen Mary. And then uh, speaking of Rodman, he wants to try the kilt on, but he wants Piper in it with him. Uh, he doesn't believe in this garbage. There's no flare on tonight. Rick Snyder's gone. Uh, he doesn't know what the horsemen are. He says his family is cuckoo, uh, which, by the way, his family, I guess we should mention now, the family, I guess, did get the long gone to Charleston because <laughs> he, 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 we went from, <laughs> we went from I'll never turn my back on these guys to I'll accept you, but my family will be there at ringside to they are never mentioned again. Or Piper probably again. told them they had to pay their own, yeah. own travel transit, and they are like, I mean, "Yeah, we're good. We'll watch it home. Yeah. We'll watch it from at home." Poor, poor John did that. That's so sad. Uh, Hogan. They could and at least Robert. had him. Like they could have done another thing where those other two jabrones are like knocked out by the NWO yes. backstage. Yes. You could have filmed it at Nitro. You didn't have to fly yes. him, and maybe yes. have Tenta come out as like Piper's muscle or something. Just like give him a little something. Yes. Uh, he says Hogan and Robin together, you get Fredericks of Hollywood, and then you also get Hulk Hogan. Uh, a lot of rambling for Brody here. Mm -hmm. uh, Jarrett, Big Wah, looking, you know, fresh as a daisy, not, not really selling his injuries because he had to bring it back. Mongo come in. Um, <laughs> and then uh, Piper says, you're the one who said I can't trust these guys, talking about Gene. And then, of course, for old time's sakes, gets one more uncensored. Uh, and and uh, Jarrett raids this in, thankfully, saying they're united. The other teams are going to be marked mid. Mago says remember, he remembers being hit with the spray paint can. Uh, you got a basketball player from Chicago, but he'll show everyone who the icon from the sports world of Chicago is tonight. Benoit says there's one reason he became the icon, and that was making the right decisions, uh, and he did that. He made the right decision by standing with them right there. Uh, he keeps, uh, Piper keeps claiming to Gene that he's the one that instigated that he couldn't trust this guy. Yeah, and that media, uh, the media is always and, in the mix. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, and then he ends up saying, Hey, I like him. Let's go. So there we go. And, uh, Deborah looks like she was going to say something, but got cut off from time, probably from Piper rambling. Uh, this, this was bad Piper again. He, he's mm -hmm. really kind of went south very quickly for me. Um, uh, where his, uh, nonsensical, Kind of, I, I I don't know. It's it's it, he's so like he just diverts from yeah. here there, and his lines, you know, his his one liners can always be hit or miss. But the stuff with Robman, especially now, looks terrible. Like rewatching. Well, it. we're a year, we're almost exactly a year removed from the homophobic stuff with Golda. So he's just, yeah, he's just running it yeah. back here with Robman. Yeah. So it this this I thought at the end like kind of steered the ship when the horseman came in but um this is probably like a six minute provo set piece that could have been either not non-existent or two minutes at max yeah it was yeah the, the rambling doesn't make sense it's and then like him he's trying to figure out oh figure, what do you hate you and you hate it, it was like all right, we, we've we've seen this play out for like five months. We don't need Piper trying to crack the case of what's going on here. Yes. And then the other thing is, apparently Jarrett is in for Flair. That that was never announced on anything. Um, you know, Flair, right? I don't think they ever said it on Nitro or anything that Flair wasn't going to be in the match. But <laughs> Jarrett was taking his place. Well, on Nitro, they kind of said like, "I'm not back, but I have my Horseman." So I don't think they. I think they did good enough saying that Flair wasn't gonna be in the match, but I I don't I, think it was that obvious. I don't I don't, I don't think it was I don't have any there's no justification on why Flair and Arn aren't there. Now right. I mean they could have done something quick because we'll get to the main event. The main event's very chaotic. Um they kind of handcuffed themselves in the main event with that because on one hand, you could have said, like, everybody's barred from ringside. 
And here's here's what I would have done, and this could have this could have retconned everything. You could just said, you know, Flair and Orn have been barred from ringside. All WCW wrestlers are barred from ringside, and all NWO members are barred from ringside. You could have done that if on the Nitro the week before <clears throat> when they showed Hogan and Rodman. Yeah, he's not in yet. Rodman you know, Hogan says we got to talk some business, brother. Like that's all right. they got to do. Then when Rodman comes out, because he's the only one that comes out on this show till after the match is over, right? Then he could come out in the NWO, and they then you could say like, well, Hogan got to him, and then that's that. That mm-hmm. would have been a great like he wasn't officially NWO till he. Right that, that, right then, uh, have to worry about the step. The step still got honored. Yeah, I right. think it's the way to go because. To me, it does. It makes zero sense that Flair and Arn aren't here, and I think no. they even say they'll be on Nitro or something. Yeah, like, they do. They say, say they'll, they'll be, be on Nitro. So it's like, why would it's in there? It's Charleston, Savannah. It's not like they're like across the country. It's like, what are we doing? I mean, none of yeah. it makes sense. Um, and again, like, I don't think it was that clear that he wasn't gonna be in this match. I think they did probably. They might have said it, but I think they tried to hide it a bit, probably to like make people think they're gonna get to see Flair here. And I'm sure they originally planned on it, and he just wasn't ready. I'm guessing. I don't think it was like a fake. Set up. I think they probably just didn't realize it, and then it was too late. But yeah, so it's like they did this interview, and Jared suddenly in the in the match. It's like okay, yeah. I I think it's honestly with the flare part. I think they knew when the horseman joined that he wasn't in it. It was just so cobbled together because of the Piper's family bombing that they didn't right. make it clear enough to the viewer. Like they didn't well, have that. This is all. the problem because it's the one problem with, with a flair in this era and Piper being part of it. They're hard to follow a lot of like if you're unless you're really following along, they, they say things that you can't track. Piper is really bad at it. Flair is like spotty, but and when that happens, it's like you can't really follow the story all the time. So maybe he said it, but it's kind of you don't know if he really means it, what he's saying sometimes. Like because he rambles and and yells so much you don't know like what he's saying is real or not. Piper's definitely like that. Like you don't know what the fuck he's talking about at the time. So it's hard yeah. to follow sometimes like all right is Flair just saying he's not back yet, but he's gonna be back there. Uh Piper says you're on the team, but he's not on the team. Like it's hard to follow because they ramble so many so much. Yeah. I mean Melts are already had the May date. In the Observer, so that's right. why I think like they obviously should have known it just wasn't conveyed, I guess, clear enough. Um, back to the ring. <clears throat> this is uh, our kind of lucha showcase match on this show. Ultimate Dragon or Psychosis, uh, two uh, <laughs> infamous WCW spelling guys in one match. Uh, Mike Tanay gets come in on commentary. Uh, some good Matt wrestling stars. Tanay gives us some background. Uh, Dragon gets his flurry of kicks. Ono uh, on the outside calls him and all Japanese wrestlers superior. Uh, Psychosis has a bit of an advantage, but again, Ultimo is able to hit the insecurity and locks on a camel clutch. Um, this this match and this crowd overall is a little weird. Um, we'll get to it. There's two matches on this show. This and the IK of Mysterio match. They're not reacting and uh with IK and Mysterio I that's could be the IK effect but I I thought they were kind of unnecessarily harsh to this match for sure um they they kind of treat them like you know we don't know these guys so we're just not reacting because I thought the action itself was actually good uh Bobby says psychosis travels by rickshaw odd line there um psychosis reverses into a clutch of his own goes to the top and lands a huge leg drop that was nasty i think it was dragon uh, he meant the rick shrugs he says uh today says dragon has had a hectic schedule between wcw and mexico like bouncing back and forth and then he says he uses a rickshaw so it okay. was odd but there we go uh dragon's back on the advantage gets sleeper so back and forth psychosis hits a twisted leg sleep from the top Su- suicide tope uh, Tony lets us know that uh, in this arena, I guess they're uh, like an AH, probably AHL or some hockey team. So, uh, you know, it's actually laying over ice. Uh, so hard surface to land on. Uh, psychosis, slingshot, leg drop to the outside. Uh, you know, so some crazy moves like psychosis is going for it, which he always does. Uh, just not much of a reaction. Then uh, Ultimo is able to come back. He bumpy 
backflips Hycosis over on the apron to the floor. Back spring elbow on the floor and the ICA moonsault. Uh, Sony Odo gets involved, kicks Psychosis to the biggest pop of the match so far. Uh, Mark Curtis kind of funnily asks Odo what he did, and uh, Odo says that Psychosis slipped on the outside. Uh, back inside, Dragon gets the boots off for two. He puts his head down. Psychosis goes for the power bomb. We get some reversals and back and forth, and Ultimo's able to lock in a lot of he's to a cradle, what to uh, today calls correctly, uh, for a two count. Both go up for the superplex and. Uh, Kind of do it where they're reversing it on each other so they both land face down. Nobody's able to hit the move. That looked pretty cool. Uh, Ultimo gets caught on the top rope and Psychosis gives a Marana and then Ultimo gets the running Liger Bob and the kind of Tornado DDT from the top and a Tiger Suplex to end it. Uh, so a good quality win for Ultimo Dragon. And this overall I thought was good Lucha action. Um Featuring kind of the cruiserweight division. I, I thought this was a good showcase for the cruiserweight division. I thought this was really hindered by the crowd. A little bit hindered by uh, some lack of psychology. There wasn't a lot of like limb work or uh, kind of connective tissue like you had in the opener. Uh, but a lot of big moves. Uh, a cool kind of highlight package match that you could condense down uh, into like a YouTube highlight video. And it'd be, it looked like a, a, a great match based on that. Uh, but overall I thought it was still good. I went three and a quarter. Yeah, I liked it. Um, even though the style isn't what you probably would have expected the structure, Tony in the beginning says, Sonny Ono has a new digital camera and his photos will be on the internet. So there you go. <laughs> early, early, get early adapters to the, uh, plug in the website. The, uh, yeah, I thought the work was interesting. I, I like the ending stretch. I, I think that picked up. There's a funny moment, too, where Dusty is trying to say he trained the Tijuana, trying to make jokes, I think, about like partying in Tijuana, but he could barely get it out. He's like laughing as he's saying it. Commentary is all over the place in this match. They are not really hanging with it much at all. They just keep jumping around. Uh, but that finishing stretch I liked, even though I thought most of the match was more grounded than you'd anticipate. Um, they really had a chance to go wild after that opener because the opener was more map based too and more of a story. Like this was their chance to really come out here and like fly around and wake the crowd up back. I'll keep the crowd up, I should say, because they were off the opener. Um, but really, outside of a few hard spots late, they didn't go that path. Dragon just kind of grinded and dominated. Um, but again, I think if they tightened it up, it would have been even hotter. I think the crowd would have been more into it. That said, they got a lot of time. I like both guys. I went three and a half. I like the match. I just think in a different. Pace could have also worked and maybe popped even more for this. What the show needed. Now we get one of the infamous segments. It's uh, June with Diamond Dallas Page. He uh, shields the hotline again. Tony says, "Hey, if Rick can't go, what about DDP?" Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, when DDP comes out, Gene brings up Randy Savage, not knowing his name. DDP says, "Look at all these people; they know his name." Gene directly asked him if he'd sub in for Rick in the main event. So putting him on the spot. Uh, crowd chants for DDP. He says, hey, Macho, you hear that? He came here to the knowledge of the fact that since Savage knocked him out, he's refused to answer his challenge. He said it once. He'll say it again. If you're that much of a Savage, snap into this. Bang. Um, so it, it, the good kind of high energy DDP, but he's mm -hmm. definitely getting that crowd reaction as we talk. Oh yeah, he's it, he's ready to rock. He's sustained and over. Uh, right as he gets done with that, Savage will get the brother, 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 <laughs> which is always my favorite. Um, and Savage is at the announce booth, which is kind of elevated over off to the side of the set uh, with with Miss Elizabeth. Miss Elizabeth is uh, looking cocky with him. Uh, he says, I want to apologize to Paige and everyone in the building. He misjudged DDP. He's got respect for him. Uh, as, as Macho Man and Liz were walking through the airport, they saw the magazine of all Playboy nude celebrities. On the cover is an old girlfriend of his, Pamela Anderson. Remember, we did Baywatch together. <laughs> and funny. Elizabeth's just like sitting there like, oh. <laughs> well, they weren't together. Yeah, this is funny. It's like Tim Wilder completely divorced now, but there we go. Uh, Paige is like, don't go there, brother. Uh, so Miss Elizabeth has the magazine. She opens it up. Savage says, now I know who you are. The wife is the centerfold. And that's when um, 
Miss Elizabeth turns it around to reveal Kimberly in the centerfold with the NWO over the uh, unmentionables. And uh, Savage calls him Kimberly's husband. And he says, that's <laughs> weed, brother. Uh, Dusty, they cut, They you can see Dusty in the background. As Savage is doing his promo, and Dusty is just loving it. He is uh, licking his chops, has a huge grin on his face at this uh, ankle unfolding. Uh, so um, <clears throat> uh, Kimberly comes out. She rushes out from the uh, entranceway, and she kind of looks all frazzled, has spray paint all over her chest and stuff, and uh, DDP's kind of like, what's going on, and goes to console her has his back to where Savage was, and immediately Savage attacks him. Like, he comes out of nowhere. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this we talk about Savage with how, like, fast he can be. Like, when he goes to the top rope, how he makes everything frantic, and just that's one of his best attributes as a wrestler. And this is part of it. Like, his attack, it, it, it feels like he ran over there, like Usain Bolt. Um, Because he just comes out of nowhere, uh, completely attacking Savage from behind. Uh they put, they spray paint some more as uh, Kim falls on top of K of uh, Page to kind of cover him up after he's laid out. Uh, Savage gra- grabs the spray paint, uh, but Miss Elizabeth says, "Let me do it," and she continues to spray paint Kimberly. Uh, Tony says, "What a vixen she's been." <laughs> I don't think that's the word he meant. <laughs> uh, Liz. Liz says you should be thrilled. The NWO loves you. Gene calls Savage sick. Savage says, No, he's the man. I like him. NWO for life, brother. And uh Kimberly likes him a lot. Can't you tell? So so this really, you know, we we talked about like that. I was surprised how much this angle had kicked off. But this is an infamous angle. I think this is one of the more infamous ones in the nwo run and this feud is so um recognized for anybody that's watched wcw from this time frame you think of the diamond Dallas page macho feud and uh this this really kick started this, this is like the you know this is the uh chris jericho punches Shawn michaels wife moment at right, SummerSlam yeah, yeah. 98 or uh summer 2008 like you had interactions before and stuff was going on, but that elevates this feud to the next level. And uh, great, great angle, great acting by Savage. Page is completely over, and you get the women involved, which I think adds a lot of intrigue. Like, you haven't seen Miss Elizabeth in this role. Like, she was a little bit healed with flair, but more just like, I'm taking Randy's money, and, you know, like like this. She was kind of a vixen. Now she's a real vixen. Yeah, this is, uh, I think, a more... Um, it, it it definitely looked more natural to me in this angle where she was playing it up and enjoying herself. So so a great angle for me. Um, one I always love watching, and no different here. She was due to be be kind of a bitch, like she hadn't ever done it, and now is the perfect time for it. So it's good. Yes, I think there's a couple co- comps that work. Like Piper, I was thinking when Piper kicks Cindy Lauper, like that really elevates that feud to the next level, even though they'd already kind of been bickering a little bit when he has a brawl. And MSG, but I think the one that's really a good comp because it includes Savage is when he cost Warrior the belt at Rumble 91. So they had already been mm-hmm. kind of building and building. Savage had been challenging him. Warrior had been kind of, you know, ignoring him. And then he says, well, fuck you. He bashes him with the scepter, costing the belt. And then, you know, the feud ramps up from there. So I think that's like a good comparison. It seems similar to that. This is really well done. It's instant mega heel heat for Savage. The feud's on fire already. Um, and this is going to be the final elevation point for Page. Like, he's already just about there after he ditched the NWO earlier in the year. He's been kind of squashing guys. He's been working his way up. And now he's getting, like, I mean, what's Savage? 1D of the NWO. Like, they're all ones. So he's getting, like, a top guy at the NWO. He's not he's not screwing out the Bagwells and the Bubbas anymore. He's he's with sure. Savage now. Right. And it's Savage's first feud as a heel, too, in, in WCW. So it's a, kind of a big thing for him. He hasn't really had, a like, a big-time feud with anybody as a heel. So... Um, it's big for both of them. This was really well done. I like bringing Kimberly into it too because it kind of gives symmetry on both sides, right? It's kind of what Liz used to be, kind of like the the glamour, you know. I don't say glamour girl because it's a different context of wrestling, but whatever. Um, kind of the 
pinup, I guess, right, with Savage and kind of classy. And now she's turned into kind of a tough girl and, you know, running her mouth and, and being sneaky. Whereas now Kimberly's kind of be presented as more of like the, you know, the good girl and the, I don't want to say classy because she's a playboy, but I guess playboy can be classy. So yeah, it's tasteful. It's not, it's not penthouse. <laughs> a slur or what? Yeah. Huh. <laughs> uh, uh, so now we go to our next match. And this one's, I, I knew this match was on the show, but it's, this is, this is one of the bigger perplexing things. So it's Glacier versus Mortis. And, um, you know, in watching the build up to this show, we've had no mention, as far as I can tell, of this match, of Mortis, of James Vanderberg. So I guess this, and they've talked about on commentary that he'd been around for a couple weeks. So this this has to be one of the last times, and we'll see if there's any after this, where it's really like you're getting a pay-per-view match that was built any semblance of a build was done on not the A show or, you know, when SmackDown and Thunder, even the B show. I mean, this, this had to have been built on Saturday night or the the Saturday, Sunday syndication. Yeah, it had to be. Right. But, but um, well, I mean, we hadn't seen Vanderbird and we no. certainly hadn't had any mention of Mortis. But but here we go. So, so Mortis comes out uh, and... Cool, you know, cool looking gear, cool looking look. They mentioned Phantom of the Opera. Uh, this is a martial arts rules match, whatever the hell that means, but there you go. Uh, Mortis spits at Glacier, gets kicked down and taken over. Big back body drop by Mortis. Mortis gets a forearm, kicks in Glacier, and uh, screams about his ear. A uh, kick from Glacier sends Mortis to the rail outside. Vandenberg's yelling at fans. Uh, Bobby kind of hilariously overestimates Mortis's size at one time. I think he calls him what, like six, 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 seven. It's like, wait a minute. Yeah, it's way <laughs> over. Or Not even close, but anyway. Uh, Glacier hits a tope on Mortis, suplex on the floor from Glacier. Glacier's is certainly a lot more kind of intense than sort of his uh, methodical yeah. kicks we've seen at other points uh, in his matches so far. Uh, he chases after Vanderberg. That allows Mortis to hit a baseball slide, which Glacier takes a great bump off of, goes flying into the guardrail. And then a uh, Mortis fireman carries Glacier up the steps and sends him into the apron head first, which looked nasty, uh, and gets Bobby to compliment. I like this guy. <laughs> so he's, he's all <laughs> on Mortis. A uh, springboard leg drop from the middle rope misses for Mortis. Glacier, uh, Kind of drops down his head, though, but gets a leg drop down to the canvas. So, so this is easily the most punishment. Again, we've seen Glacier Day. Yeah, oh yeah. He looks the most vulnerable here. Uh, Glacier's able to reverse that leg drop move again into a power bomb. Front slam from Glacier and front kick gets two. Uh, Mur Mortis hits a huge roundhouse right to the dome. A great-looking kick from Mortis. Uh, but he goes up to the top and gets crotched. Uh, Glacier gets called on the top and into a northern light suplex for a two count. Glacier comes back with a, a jawbreaker and cross body for a two count. He goes for the cryotic kick, uh, but Mickey J gets put in front of him to kind of distract that. And then Mortis hits the so super kick. Uh, Bobby is into the match. Vanderberg's on the apron. He holds Glacier, but uh, Glacier ducks out of the way. Mortis is able to put on the brakes, but when he turns right around, he uh, walks right into the cryotic kick, allowing Glacier to get the wind. Um, and then, uh, and then, I, you know, we'll get the post match where <clears throat> uh, Vanderberg kind of calls from someone in the back, and uh, out comes who will be known as Wrath, former Adam Bomb, Brian Clark. Uh, he's unnamed here, but they talk mm -hmm. about, oh, how big is this guy? Um, and he gets in the ring, and they uh, beat up Glacier to show that this feud is uh, far from over. Uh, as a match, um, this may be honestly one of the more stunning match in my mind that, since we've started this show. I didn't remember thinking this was very good at all, and I thought it was definitely a good match with a lot of vulnerability from Glacier. His kicks were stiff. Uh, Mortis is a guy I, you know, I've always liked Canyon uh -huh. as a worker, 
Um, but I was a little bit afraid that he was going to kind of fall into that Al Snow um, right. kind of Scorpio vibe that we've had on the show where, you know, they they kind of presented as these, you know, great workers, great technicians, and then you rewatch and even the stuff that seems state of the art in 97 doesn't necessarily hold up and, and the other stuff's just not there, but I thought he worked a great match here, made a great debut for himself in this gimmick. Um, and, and overall, this was a real surprise, very entertaining for something that could be stupid. I mean, it is a little stupid, but, 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 but they, they kept it serious enough and true to form that I thought it was a very productive overall and now gives Glacier some sort of stakes and he seemed vulnerable. Um, so, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm on board. For sure, with this right now, I went three and a quarter on the match. Oh wow! Okay, yeah, <laughs> I liked that. It. It was not that I went two and a half. Um, I, I I did like it. I do like Mortis quite a bit. It was really perplexing that these guys have never been on Nitro. Really, I mean, Glacier obviously has been, but no more, no mention of Mortis, no mention of James Randenburg. Um, so Mortal Kombat Universe officially launches, I guess, here, but we don't really ever have any hint of it coming if you're just watching Nitro, which we're doing. I thought Mortis did look really good. It's the best Glacier's looked. Um, yeah, May just needed a real match and not just to be kind of peppering and moves on a jobber. So he did an okay job selling. We know Canyon can work, like you said, and I'm glad that that held up okay. I thought the pace was fine as well. I like Vandenberg. He's cackling away at ringside. Um, I like the post-match. I thought it was a really strong debut for Wrath. Looks cool with the big helmet on. Um, so, again, showing you this, this is just getting going. So... Uh, you know, Glacier clearly still learning, right? At times feels like it's training for him in the ring, but definitely better. Uh, I like the potential of Mortis. Um, this gives Glacier something to do. He does stay undefeated here. And this is fine if it exists in its own little world on the other card. We'll see. I'm curious what it like bridges out beyond this. But for right now, it's kind of contained to its own little universe with these guys dealing with each other. So again, I went two and a half. I did like it. Um, and I thought Glacier definitely showed some improvement. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure they worked out this match a lot, but um, you know, I mean that that can be good too. I I I, I prefer like the you know not the savage DDP method of we need to work out everything uh, ahead of time, but if if you can't work out stuff and get it Chris looking on the execution, uh, like in this match, I I think that. Uh, carries a benefit so i think for this situation it was the best case scenario yeah uh they they show the uh, steiner car crash again uh so we see that kind of just to build for main event uh then we get our strap match scotty riggs versus buff bagwell tony lets us know wcw will be a man down in the main event uh because you know ddp got laid out rick steiner's out so so they're they're gonna be a man down uh, Rick starts uh, strapping Bagwell even before he can be attached. He bails to the outside. Uh, Rick starts off as aggressive, slaps Bagwell around. Bagwell gets posted on the outside. Riggs tugged on the strap to uh, put him into the post. Dusty and Bobby are bickering at each other. Tony settles them down. Riggs uses the strap to crotch Buff and then hits a good-looking drop kick. Ties up Buff a bit, but it's too loose, and he's only able to get two turnbuckles. This, of course, is the strap uh, gimmick where you got to touch all four turnbuckles to win. Hot right. shot from Buff changes the momentum. Uh, Buff gets a line in where he looks at the camera and says, did you see how beautiful that was? God, I'm good. Uh, but Buff's very annoying, uh, like annoyingly cocky on the his yeah. uh, character work side. It, 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 I mean, it fits. <laughs> um, Buff maintains the advantage with some strap shots, but it's doing a lot of posing and choking. Uh, you know, nothing groundbreaking here with Buff on top, but I will say they had that dreadful match I thought it sold out that made no sense. And I thought right. here with Buff kind of clowning around and not taking Riggs serious, it worked better, and it didn't grind the match as much to a halt. Um, yep. It's a shorter match, too, so it just it – just, works better uh but, sold out everything sold out was like turned to crap anyway i'm not sure like yeah. this everything about it you know turned it so that didn't yeah. help either uh buff in a funny moment grabs Riggs' arms and does the overhand um yeah, american like nails flap yeah. to uh mimic it uh randy and this was the one spot i didn't like 
where Randy Anderson gets in Buff's face. They get into a shoving match, and then Randy kind of punks him down in the corner, which that happened to Buff, too, mm -hmm. in the uh, sold-out match. I can't remember which referee it was, but it's like, why does this keep happening to Buff where the referee right. just kind of punk him down? Uh, Buff misses his blockbuster uh, from the top. Riggs starts making his comeback. He's strapping Buff. Uh, power bomb by Riggs. He does the missile drop kick from the top. Riggs gets three turnbuckles, and he does help support from the fans, uh, but gets his momentum broke. Riggs gets backdropped on the outside in a nasty-looking bump where his back hits the apron, and then he's hung yeah. up. Um, that that, it, that looked it, awesome. It looked great, and it actually works for it to be the finish because mm -hmm. Buff drags him back into the middle. And doesn't like drag him around to each post. He just puts him directly in the middle. He has enough strap where he can hit all four uh, pads and wins clean as a sheet uh, to kind of end this feud. So, so hopefully, there, uh, well, hopefully. Uh, so there was a couple things on this again. The, um, mm -hmm. you know, with these strap matches we talk about, like they can get very tropey. And I yeah. really appreciated with this one. We didn't have. I think we only had like three or four attempts of winning before we had it. And then right. thankfully we didn't have the thing where Buff is hitting the, you know, the, yeah, he sneaks behind him. And tell, yeah, we get that every freaking strap match. This, uh, this was as definitive a win as you can get. Like, yeah, Ricks took a nasty spill to the outside, but with the strap, like he was hung up and, and um, that looked good. And then Buff took full advantage and won. Um, so, so this is the second match in a row. I shockingly rank is good because uh, I had no memory of this one whatsoever. But I, I thought this was a very solid mid card match that had some intensity, good buff character work. Um, he wins. He looks strong in doing it. It's it's a good kind of angle advancer to say like this is who we're pushing from this tag team going forward. Uh, so let's get behind him. Let's not just say because. You know, he's not the face, and he turned on the other guy. We need to kind of make it parody booking. Um, so three stars. I, I enjoyed this. This guy saw some snowfall yesterday on his little vacation, and now keeping it going, keeping it going today. Uh, I went two and a quarter. I thought it was good. Oh, but... Come on. There's nothing wrong with this. Yeah, it was all right. Um, oh. I did like the. I thought the finish looked awesome. The finish was great. Um, they really executed that well. Uh, the hard bump over the top, the snap into the apron, and the way Riggs bent. I mean, it looked like they fucked up. Like, that's how good it looked <laughs> because I thought they really hurt him. Uh, Dusty in here is uh, ranting on about sacks of cement and nudie magazines. Like, I don't know what he's even talking about <laughs> throughout this match. He's all over the place. Um, the hog tying was pretty good. And yeah, like you said, it's a lot of buff kind of stalling and uh, playing out to the crowd, which uh, it was good because they're pushing his character. I had a lot of a lot of strap shots, something you don't always see in these two. Um, yeah. A lot of hard smacks. The superplex was good as well. Uh, we got to get out of this with Buff, though. It's time to let the males go. <laughs> like, it's over. We've, we've clinged enough. I, I thought this was fine. It had been too drawn out, though. I This, I thought, was a good way. If uh, they have interaction after this, that's a problem. I mean, when did he join the NWO, though? It was, like, December or November, wasn't it? Like, we're still fighting with the fucking American males? Like, yeah, but they don't have much interaction. But they should have, is what I'm saying. Like, it should have been done already and move him up a Maybe. little bit. Like, it just feels like we're still, he's still stuck in this American males thing. He's been a heel with the NWO. I know he had his little tour of Japan, I guess, in there. So the man Yeah, he had a whole month he was out. I, I thought this was fine for what it was because this was definitive. I just didn't want it to be 50-50. <laughs> no, no, that, that was a plus. It's going to be, like, sold out. So now it's like, well, this feud's over, so there we go. It, it is, I thought it got too much. I was, it was tedious, I thought. Um, but I did like the usage of the strap, and I, like, I thought the finish was really tight. So those are the highlights for me. Uh, black and white promo backstage with Hogan, the Outsiders, and Macho. Hogan says Rob the Bond is hanging out in the truck. Uh, and then uh, Hogan lets us know this is almost as sweet as Paige's own lady, so he's getting shots in at DDP. Uh, Hogan explains that, uh, as he said before, they're all the same size laying down. When the when the NWO gets done at Uncensor, they will guarantee victory. Hall lets us know, hey, Ma, top of the world, look at me now. Hogan says he has a surprise for you guys uh, that happened at the initiation with Rodman. Rodman taught him a new few new tricks. 
Uh, Piper gets called a fruitcake by Hall, and he asks uh, Hogan what Rodman's wearing, where he's wearing a dress, and uh, uh, Savage says he's not wearing a training bra, is it? And uh, <laughs> Hogan lets us know that they're going to let everyone wait. And uh, then they get some more shots in on Kimberly saying, like, uh, she certainly wasn't wearing a training bra on the pictures he saw. Uh, then uh, Hall gets a funny line, I thought, where he says he thought Silicon Valley was in California talking about Kimberly Page as well. Uh, so so this was a, a, a very, like, clowny um, NWO segment uh, with these guys. But it was one where they, they were kind of filling themselves. I like the black and white usage, uh, the way it was filmed, because we haven't had these uh, preceding announcements as paid for by the NWO in a while uh, involving these guys. Uh, so I thought this was effective as kind of like a half job into the main event. Yeah, I liked it too. I thought it was definitely interesting and different. Um, they were definitely feeling it as usual. I think Savage has been a good addition for now anyway. Um, but yeah, that, they're at their best when they're just out there, you know, talking crap and and messing around. That's when they're most like relatable as just a, a group of guys messing around. And I think this is what's helped them get over and elevate so much is that they have this like camaraderie built in that they've had from the beginning. It doesn't feel forced. It feels effortless. Yeah. Leads us into our plunder, a plunder ball for the night. Public Enemy versus Hunt on Heat. Trash cans get brought in and used right away. Toilet lid is used, which Dusty absolutely loves. Uh, Sherry gets involved, hits them with a frying pan uh, on camera from the production side. They're utilizing the double box. Uh, extension cord gets choked out. Sherry again plasters Rocco Rocco the outside. Uh, Bobby and Dusty on commentary are just loving this. Uh, they yell, it's uncensored uh, multiple times on commentary. Grunge is busted open. It's a swinging net breaker back in the ring. Bacon pan pops off of Stevie Ray. Bobby asks if the referee's Betty White or uh, Betty or, Crocker. Yeah, Betty Crocker. Or, <laughs> well, he means Betty Crocker, but he says Betty White. It's Betty White. And then Mitch is Martha Stewart as well. Uh, Grunge gets laid out by both with the trash can. Dusty loves it. Uh, they put the trash can over Booker and pound him on it. Dusty says he used to do that to his little brother. He says uh, he laid his old tired ass out. Yeah. Oh no, that's uh, that's coming up. That one's coming oh, up. Right, now, right. Yeah, that, that one's the best. Can. Where where yeah, he uh, gets gets walloped with it. <laughs> he says yeah, he laid his tiny ass out. Um and uh. All that probably breaks on that one. When he says all three, all there. three of them are definitely losing that old commentary. You can hear them laughing on that. Um, then in another funny moment, uh, he gets hit with the with the pan or something. Tony corrects it as a pizza pan, <laughs> and uh, of course, Bobby and and Dusty are all over that, saying, "Well, you must be a hell of a cook, knowing all this." <laughs> Where Bobby's like, hey Tony, you can just call and get your pizza delivered. Did you know that? Uh, so they continue clogger clobbering. The match bogs down a bit. The crowd mm -hmm. starts chanting for tables. Um, another pan gets brought in, and Bobby says, Tony, I think that's a brownie pan. So continuing to clown on him. Uh, at one point, a handbag gets brought in from the crowd and used. So, so there you go. Uh, Booker <clears throat> T does an assist dive on a grunge and, uh, grunge is able to break up the pin there. Stevie Ray gets put on the table. They do the assist cannonball dive for the table. So, so that breaks the table and is used. Um, and then we go to the finish where Jared and Mongo come in. Mongo has his Halliburton. He, he, uh, creams rock with it and uh booker t is able to hit the harlem hangover to win it for harlem heat um so so this this i thought was a little bit bloated could have probably trimmed a little bit but between the commentary and the weapon shots i, I did think this was a ton of fun you know maybe again this third match in a row so we'll see i'm throwing out my star right here but i thought this was an entertaining brawl uh the commentary elevates a lot just because I mean, th this is one of those matches that WCW, to me, rules at. This is where, like, mm -hmm. with their commentary, especially this commentary team, we, we just don't get it on the other show right now. Right. Where, where this felt like 
you and your buddies in the basement watching the yeah, show just roasting it yeah, and yeah. having fun. You know, like you're not making fun of how bad it is. You're just enjoying it and making jokes and clowning each other. And it, it's a part of it. So I went three and a quarter. This is a great like hangout match. I went two and a half on this. It, it, it was who, who shit oh, your cereal when you watch this show. Well, I don't know. Well, you're you're just flying high, I think. No. Um, there's another great line too, where uh, when Sherry hits Rocco with the pan, and I, I know that we've seen him without the hair, but it, like it's uh, Dusty's. She knocked the hair right off his head because I don't know. I don't know if it's the first time Dusty's recognized that he's bald now, but yeah, yeah we've had a few comments fun. about it. No, yeah. it was fine. It's, I mean, it was a garbage match. Uh, no flow or classic spots like we get with some of these. I thought it was fine energy. Um, it felt violent, but it's kind of. It also felt kind of generic at times. I like Sherry helping. Dusty's Dusty. Uh, Harlem Heat, though, feels aimless to me. They, they need something going on. Uh, we're to the point where they need help to be public enemy. Like, like what are we like? They just felt like they've dropped so far. The signers coming back uh, really kind of surpassed them. And now they feel like they're a little bit aimless because the, it seems like the tag division has a lot going on, but there's only like really one top team. You get the horsemen too, kind of up there. So they feel a bit lost right now. Uh, the commentary and energy brought by the commentary was good. Uh, I agree it did get bogged down a little bit. I thought it dragged a little as it went on. Um, I also wasn't crazy about the finish, and there's only one reason why. I don't care that it's an interference. I don't bother me. It feels like Jarrett and Mongo have been drafted into this major story, like a big match, right? Like the whole freaking thing that Flair and Arn Anderson went to bat for was – Piper, get rid of your scrubs. We're going to give you the elite of the elite, the horsemen. This is the most important match in WCW history. We have to win. And they're out here fucking with public enemy. Like, I know they were kind of feuding, and that was supposed to be the match. But, like, yeah, they shouldn't have been fucking with this. This, is to me, is just as bad as, like, Flair and R not being there, is that they're out here screwing with these guys for no reason. Like, I guess you have maybe, like, maybe, like, Deborah came out, and, like, Rocco hit Deborah, and they have to come. Now they get drawn out by Deborah. But for them just to come out to screw with them felt like a real – Poor use of resources on their part before like this all time match. So I'm probably asking too much, but it feels like on one hand you're talking about how important this match is, and then you got Jarrett and, and Mongo so screwed around with this like low level tag team stuff. It just didn't. These are little things that aren't computing to the importance of the main event for me as this show goes on. If and honestly, it feels like as soon as the Piper thing bombed, it feels a little bit like they threw the towel in this main event. And that's to say I don't like it. Like we'll get to it. I, I like it, but it feels like. They kind of gave up a bit. Like the rules are convoluted. They kind of half ass explain them. Uh, Jared gets thrown in for Flair at the last minute. Uh, Steiner's now out of here. Like it feels like they just, like we're just trying to get by it at this point. Like, like okay, well, like everything got fucked up. Let's just get it behind us and move on. Like that's what it's starting to feel like to me. Man, I, I was wanting to look at Meltzer's ratings. He is, this is probably the furthest out will be ratings wise with him. So he went 3.75 for the opener, 3.5 Ultimo versus Psychosis, 1.75 Glacier Mortis, 1.25 for the strap, two and a half here. And we'll get to, I'll just say his last two ratings are 1.5 for IK over Mysterio. Then he gives a dud for the main event, which we'll get to. I think that's one of his like absolute all time bad ratings. I, I can't wait to read the torch. Or, I mean, the uh, observer to see what his justification for that match being a dud is. Uh, I, I think that's just like an all time horrendous rating. Um, but we'll, but we'll see. All right. Moving I on. Think I think it's a lot of WCW that his age is better than what it was. I and mean, we keep seeing it in the comments and the readers and everything else. Like, but people are just already kind of aggravated with some of this stuff. And it's a weird time. As fans, like it's uh, and what like how long did they think this energy. angle was gonna last? Though that's what yeah, that's my whole thing with it. I mean, you know, maybe that is some conditioning that God knows we've been trying to figure out who the head of the table was for three and a half years now in current day. But it wasn't I mean, a lot of long term. Christ, this is eight months, and they're already like, we got to be done with this. Besides the mega powers, how many like long term, higher concept, big time angles have there been though? Like, yeah, there's well, been feuds that have lasted years, like right, like like Hogan and Andre, but it's well, kind of Hogan and Andre in and out. though also gets this in '88, where I mean it's crapped on in '88, where it's like we yeah. got to move on, right? 
I think the Mega Power is the only one that has like a full year that never had any. But I wasn't. I don't know. I wasn't dialed into the sheets at eighty nine. So maybe they're sure bitching they about that probably, too. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. It's 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 just very weird that it's so. I don't know, like that it's so uh, antagonistic on the show overall. Like everything's so. It it just feels like everything is so uh, is is. I don't know that, that it's one of those weird things where stuff that doesn't make oh I don't want to venture into more modern day, but something like in current day, there's been two shows where Damien Priest has this cash in at any time, and this champion that comes out there has came out on the shows that he's at and talked about how injured he is and he can't wrestle, right. and we hear no interaction. It's like if you transport that to 1997, it feels like Meltzer and Keller would just be like completely berating and kill. I mean, it is as much as people talk about how like negative they are. I actually think they're more positive and and um, forgiving for the current product. Honestly, yeah. I, I don't know what was up with WWE this time. Like, I a little bit of it was like. I don't know. Like it's not like as Dave a big ECW guy. So I feel like that was like ECW no. painted these, these two giants as like intact, like the big bad, like you know Bischoff. Everyone hates Bischoff, and maybe it's this lingering bullshit from like '95 and ni- early '96 still that it's like hasn't shaken. But I mean, at the time, I liked both. Like I had, I, I was not a nitpicky fan, but I was also 16. Like I, I don't know, I was into everything. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I Keller know. only gives the main event a star. It's, I think it's, I it's a wild the it's just wild. I think it became a real quick talking point and and that just got beaten into the ground right away. Like everyone was done with like the WDF guys that were on top, like Hogan, Savage. Uh, I mean, I don't know, Lou Gallagher. Like, I don't, I don't know. Like maybe it's done with them, and like they really just wanted to see. I know that's where it gets to a 98, 99. Like they just want to see Benoit and, and Malenko and Guerrero, like. And those guys elevate up and be used and be the top guys, but um, Jericho eventually. But yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. It's really weird. Yeah, I mean uh, the uh, reader feedbacks all over the place: nine, 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 eight, two point five, three point five. It's it's a it's a very weird spot, but all right. All right. Uh, well, I feel better about my my grades now. Yeah, well, you're one of the dummies like these people. I'm reading the <laughs> comments. <on. laughs> you want to be lumped with this? Let me read you Jason Smith's 2.5. For I, second can tell you, I, don't, I can tell you I don't have the main event at 5, so if that's going to be a problem, we can get it out now. For the second year in a row, I went into the uncensored pay-per-view without a clue as to what the main event rules were, which is fair. Uh, and Phil ripped off and want my 28 bucks back. The only good thing about the vet is it means I won't have to sit through another Hogan versus Piper fiasco. This was billed as last man standing, but came off as the WWF final four with one tenth of the effort. I didn't care for this event at all. It's like, I mean, uncensored did have a bad track record. I'll say that. <laughs> well, yeah, but one. now you can't judge that based on what I know. I know, I know. Well, when you're in the moment, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's I mean, hard to judge in the moment now. Like, 20 whatever years later you know but i know like like, even like even in the message this feels like a very like message board divisive show because i know like simon from handwork reviews likes his show and this is always like a big dylan hell show so i i think i'm just conditioned i was conditioned on like the pwo dvd vr side that i'm very and i've always sided with that when I've watched before that to hear the backlash, I, 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 I guess this is just, this is one of these shows where we'll get to, but even when I've watched it before, like, I mean, I was watching at the time, I didn't watch this show at the time, but when I watched the VHS tape, you know, as an 11 year old, I wasn't like, well, this sucks. And then when I watched stuff in my message board days, I was like, yeah, this is great. And then now tonight I, I enjoyed watching it again for this pod that I haven't fully besides saying like your burnout on Hogan and Savage. I don't see much of a, 
And they're, it's not like they're all, I mean, they are featured on this show, but it's in hot angles. But anyway. Well, the interesting right. thing is we're not even to the era yet of like the screwy main event. Every main event ends no. in screw job. We get a little bit, but not, not like it's going to become, at least we assume it's going to become. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's hard to get back in that mentality and, and wonder what some of them are thinking. I mean, overall, I've been pro all of this. It's just this one for whatever reason. Some of these didn't resonate with me as much. Yeah. All right, uh, here and we that's go. That's not going to change with our next match. I can already tell you that. Well, our next match is our next match. Uh, so we get a promo. Scott Giant and Lex Luger. Scott says this is the first time he's seen Rick carried out of the ambulance. He didn't like it. Uh, he doesn't need incentive to beat the NWO down, but this has added fuel to his fire. He tells Piper and Horseman to stay out of his way. Giant says it's time for him to do some spring cleaning. He's known Rick Steiner well. And uh, he is as hard-headed, hard body, tough individual as they come. He's going to choke slam everyone left and right. He puts over Scott and Lex. Uh, it's time to do some racking, some choke slamming, and some suplex. And Gene asks Lex if this is insurmountable odds for him to overcome. Lex says, this is more than a plain and simple wrestling match. It's about society and anti-society edict. Luger says the NWO has no respect for authority. WCW, there's a lot of tradition and honor, but the NWO doesn't have any. Adversity has brought all three of them together, and he's never been more prepared for a wrestling match in his life. So I, I thought this was a fun promo. Uh, really good stuff by Luger, like giving, mm -hmm. say, an edict and uh, bringing in tradition and honor. WCW, uh, a good kind of rally the troops, but a uh, centered promo, especially from Lex here. It was really good. I mean, Luger has been on, completely on fire. Uh, I like the approach that they've taken with Giant, where he's against the NWO. He'll do whatever it takes to take them out. But he's deferring to Luger because Luger was the one that allowed him to come back in and stood by him. And he lets Luger leave the team gladly. You know, he doesn't continue to there's no there's no tension there between the two of them. I like that. And there's also some cool little parallels to Sting and Luger, right? Like Sting opened the door to Luger to come back in when everyone was against it. Everyone hated him. No one wanted him here. Sting, instead of the olive branch, brought him in. Now Luger's doing the same thing to the Giant. So I think there's like some cool little storytelling within that. Um, and yeah, they're great. Luger's been awesome. He is completely primed for a main event run. Um, the question will be, is it too, is it just bad timing for him, right? Like you see, there's times where guys just get so hot, but the time isn't right. And we'll see if this is one of them or if they give him the chance. So, All right. Now our favorite Prince Ikea versus Rey Mysterio Jr. Rey Mysterio's in his Spider-Man gear. Today's back on commentary. Uh, quick start. Rey looks you know, looks fresh. He hits a lot of his uh, high spot summer springboard somersault sent on. Uh, today lets us know that since this match is on pay per view, the time limit's been extended from 10 minutes to 15 minutes. Ray takes Prince over. Shrunk it. <laughs> yeah. I would have uh, been happier. Head, uh, because it's Prince I OK, <laughs> we're taking the time limit down to five minutes. Correct. Uh, head scissors takes Prince to the outside, flip splash uh, to the floor for Ray. Um, crowd's completely dead here. Uh, Prince gets a power bomb, uh, springing Mysterio from the back to the top rope to gain advantage. Baseball slide from Prince sends Ray to the outside. Uh, Prince's dive has some good hang time here. So here's my problem. I mean, IRK is certainly like overbooked, um, which is frustrating. He's a, he's interesting. I thought in ring in this match because I think he like between his dive here. Uh, he hits a Northern Light suplex later on. He has some good execution on some of his moves. Some of his other stuff doesn't look very good at all. But I think the biggest issue is he's just such a charisma suck that it makes yeah. the matches feel so drawn out um, because there's no investment at all except for when he's going to lose, uh, which he hasn't yet. Um, so, so that's that's just the biggest problem. We get some boring chance here. Um, we go to the finishing stretch. There's a lot of reversal near falls. Ray hits the twisting moonsault right as the bell rings. He kind of looks like a goober, thinking he wins for a minute. And once Penzer announces that there's a time limit draw, the crowd is just pissed and over it. And I think they thought maybe that Ray won, um, but uh, Ray 
gets the mic. He asks for more time. That gets that does actually get cheers from the crowd. Uh, Prince says, you're right. You deserve more time, and he's fine with it. So they start the bell again. Bobby says, tomorrow everybody's going to be talking about how big of an idiot Prince IK is. And uh, they do like probably one to two more minutes of a back-and-forth action where Ray hits a twisting head scissor and hits his Rana but uh, Prince is able to roll forward to get the fluke win again. Um, yeah, I mean, we talked about it. It's time definitely to eject from this title reign. Should have called an audible or something. Um, match I thought was decent entering with a horrendous crowd. Um, you know, I mean, IK is just dragging Ray down. So two and a quarter. Yeah, I mean, he's sleep inducing. I mean, it's like, and he may, he's like a pitcher that maybe flashes a game here and there. And you think, oh, there's something in there, but most of it starts the garbage. Like, this is Prince. Like, oh, he's got a couple flashes here and there, but he can't put the rest of it together. At least not yet. And on the stage, you're doing him a big disservice. Like, yeah, they may think they're like being good to him by pushing him um, and giving him this chance, but they're really hurting him because yeah. he's. He's building up a, an innate hatred from a fan base. It's probably not going to forget what they've had to sit through through all these uh, months here. The dusty finish is, is really stupid. Um, you know, when Ray, who's like a super beloved face, asks for the match to continue to go after the TV title, the crowd boos because they don't want to see any more of it. Like they don't, even, they don't even care if Ray has a chance to win. They don't even want to see any more of this fucking match. They're done with it. So uh, just a really bad idea. And then even stupider idea to have Prince retain. There's no need for him to keep this belt. I don't get what they're trying to do. Um, there's just no chance uh, that this is going to work. So you just got to bail out of this. Uh, you know, same issue, same as last show to me, same issues. Uh, Ray wants to play flat, play fast. Prince has to keep slowing him down. The crowd is out. This is nothing to get into a Prince. It's a waste of Ray too. This card is such a great roster and he could be doing so much more. Put him in Rick Steiner's spot. You know what I mean? Like let him elevate up. Give him a big moment. That would have been much better use than this than what we get. Uh, way too long, just like the last match, and that at least had the plunder to keep it happy. I think it took balls to go with 15 and then have a draw and then go longer, and then Prince wins anyway. <laughs> it's, like, it's, a, it's nonsense. And if you take a little off of this, you take a little off of the tag, I think you could have had – you have guys up and down Nitro that could have had a match. Where's Chris Jericho? You know, even like a La Park. I mean, there's other guys you could have had on this card, right, to fill some time um, that could have had another match. So it's like some of these just are longer than they needed to be. I appreciate that their WCW pay per views have given matches time to breathe and they focus on go, go, go with matches. That's cool. Um, but some of these just aren't worth the time they're given. Like, there's no reason this should have been 15 plus with Prince IUK at this time in this career. So I went two stars. Um, and, and most of it's on the work array. Yeah. Uh, finally, I set a, a pretty fun ad for the next show where we get the spring stampede and it's the horsemen riding horses and Mongo on a horse was an entertaining flair on a horse. Uh, you know, it's just kind of their generic, like, we got to figure something out, blah, blah, blah. Spring stampede coming April 6th. So, uh, there we go. But it, this was much more entertaining than. Humor it was fine. It's just, it's just kind of silly that the horsemen is still trying to unite. Like, like even in ads, they're, they can't get. They're together. horsemen. I know. They're they still can't. They're still fighting. Uh, I like the idea of using them in a stampede-based ad. It's just funny yeah. that they're still pissing and moaning with each other, even in the ad. Yeah. Well, who knows when that was filmed? Uh, Buffer runs down the stipulations, which is, is convoluted. So, so I, I think this is the first time we hear about this time limit thing where. Like, the first three guys come in for five minutes. It's basically like war games, but it's with each team. So, we get five minutes and then two-minute intervals. Uh, the next person comes in. And he also runs down the stipulations. The crowd actually cheers for Hogan versus Piper in the cage. So, again, this is where, like, my disconnect comes, where it's like, if online you're hearing, like, you know, if, if you were – it's a, it's an interesting it's just an interesting time because it's like when he says Hogan versus Piper when he's running down all the stipulations that gets the biggest pop for the cage. So if they're so tired of it, why is these people cheering for the thought? I think that? it's just a disconnect between the fans in the arena that are in this area, right, and and the fans watching at home that may be a little bit more dispersed and 
angry. Yeah, well, they, I mean, we I, see I, a, I mean, the internet fans are generally more angry. Like when you when you're that in the bubble, and it's already starting here, where you're just like you're in your little world, you're in your bubble, you're getting the same thoughts and feelings as th- those are getting compounded because you're talking to people that feel and think the same way, and that's just, that tends to spill out. So if you're only reading a certain blog or message, there's not a lot at this time. So if yeah, you're I guess there's reality, more tribalism here that's more isolated on your community. Yeah, yeah, you can't find as easily outside, like as, as much of a shithole and cesspool as Twitter is, you at least could find variable thought processes, right? It's easier to go out and find those because there's so many blogs and so many podcasts and so many mess, not mess boards much anymore. We have so many forums back there's then. Yeah, forums. it was very limited, very limited. So if you were either reading like CRZ uh, or you're reading, uh, you know, Sharer, Net right. Cop, or yep. Melser, net cop, right. That's all you got. Like, there's only a handful. Skya, I guess. Like, there's only a handful. And some of them do. If you go back and read that stuff, they're slanting negative on a lot of these things already. All right. So, our first guy's in, or Hall, Benoit, and then the giant comes out. Dusty's fired up. He's like, here we go. So, he's all excited about that. Benoit and Hall go after each other right from the bell. Giant kind of looks on. Then he gets in. It's both with a big double clothesline. Giant chops away at Benoit, throws him across the ring. Tony mentions Flair and Anderson aren't there, but they'll be on Nitro, as we talked about earlier. Uh, Some good back-and-forth three-way action here, which I think was more, uh, you know, I didn't even think about it till watching it this time, but, like, WCW, they done kind of those triangle tags and stuff, but this is really the first time from WCW and WWF perspective, which WWF did have the Final Four, um, <clears throat> month earlier uh but but for a three-way this is the first time we've seen like three guys interacting which was becoming more of a staple obviously with uh ecw right, right. and stuff but now brought to wcw choke slam from benoit pins kind of broken up which is a surprise hall probably wasn't supposed to do that uh giant charges in uh with a big charge but then gets dumped over the top rope and is eliminated it's a it's a good looking spot i think it's a good way to eliminate the giant because he looked dominant in this period problem was i don't know if the announcers knew the steps or what because they seem as surprised as anybody when buffer says he's eliminated and this is that this the actual match itself and the execution i think is pretty flawless on this match as we'll get to uh, I think what prevents it from being, in my mind, like an absolute like classic is the hindrance going in on what the structure and the stipulation was. Because right. the over-the-top rope carries a big component of a lot of the eliminations. Mm-hmm. Um, and this one was the first of it where it's just like, oh, well, he's gone. And it's like, oh, what the hell happened? Uh, well, I think so- they realized, too, that like... um they probably had eight or nine guys in here that weren't going to take pins. So yes, you either have that, to do that's this the problem. Yeah. Right. You got a lot of guys not wanting to do jobs here. Right. Yeah. So you're either going to do this or you have to do elimination where if one guy gets beat, the whole team is out. Right. Right. So right. then you could have, I think you whatever. could have done that, but yeah. yeah. Jerry yeah. take the fall and then Scott take the fall and you're covered, you know? Right. Uh, so Jarrett, Savage, and Luger are out next. Luger gets a power slam on Jarrett. <coughs> Savage attacks Luger. They go after it. Some good action between them two. Uh, press slam Savage, but Hall gets kicked in uh, to uh, break that up. Next round is up. Mongo walks in with purpose. Nash is behind him. Uh, and then uh, Scott Steiner, which you know is the last member for Team WCW, so they're done now. Nash hits the snake eyes on Benoit. Steiner gets a tilt to world slam on Jarrett. Butterfly suplex to Hall, and they talk about, um, you know, like he's been waiting to get revenge on the outsiders. Uh, Nash is waiting for Hall. He drives him, I mean, for Steiner. He drives him into the corner, but Steiner gets his foot up and then hits a nasty looking belly to belly. Um, and I want to mention the crowd. Like through this match, like the crowd is dead for the, the cruiser stuff, but. They make this match, to me, really feel like a big fight because they're on their feet for almost this entire match, and the action's pretty frantic with all the guys coming in. Um, so so I think this really carries on like a chaotic, fun pace uh, throughout this yeah. match. The only time but, they really got killed off is when Giant went out because they didn't really understand it. So they were yes. kind of – and then they were okay. Right. Uh, Benoit saves Jarrett from outsider's edge. Uh, Nash is able to clothesline Jarrett over the top rope. He's gone. And then uh, Mongo gets dumped by Hall. So 
Uh, I guess I was okay with that, but I do think that makes the horsemen look a little weak. But I mean, it on one hand, it makes the outsiders look dominant. So I, I don't know. It, it I I went back and forth on that, but but I I did like that spot and let it did make the outsiders look pretty dominant here. Uh, pretty quickly after that, Steiner is kind of hanging on on the apron, and Nash does a charging, running big boot, and he gets knocked out, and he's gone. So, so a lot of bodies are gone before our last two guys come in, which is Piper. He comes out first with his icon shirt. Um, and on um, commentary, they make sure to note that like it's just Luger left from Team WCW, um, and it's uh, Piper and Benoit is only left from Team uh, Piper. Uh, then we get a countdown for some random reason, but it shouldn't have been, and Hogan comes out. So here comes Rodman and Hogan. They're arm in arm. Rodman's holding the belt and has a can of spray paint. Uh, on the uh, entrance, Rodman now has the NWO guy with the voiceover that says, the real hot rod, Dennis Rodman, for his uh, NWO theme. Piper's Dirty choking dog. Out. Yeah, the Pipers choke it out savage. They spill to the outside and brawl there. Hogan's in the ring. We get a We Want Sting champ. Piper gets thrown through the rope and then drags Hogan out. They brawl. Hogan tries to flee through the crowd, uh, which is pretty funny. Savage, once again, for the second time tonight, comes flying in off the camera. He almost takes out Bill Apter as he does this in a funny spot. Uh, Tony brings up how the NWOs had good teamwork, which is true. Like they've been the most cohesive team of all these these teams, mm-hmm. which which makes sense. Uh, Piper gets sent in. Rodman pulls down the top rope, eliminating Piper. I love this spot. I I yeah, thought like this was a great spot. Security's immediately around. <laughs> holding Piper back. He's chasing after Rodman. This is just quite a scene. Uh, Hogan's beating on Piper some more on the outside. Hogan's holding Piper for Rodman to beat him. Meanwhile, <laughs> at the ring, we get the outsider's edge, which is given to Benoit, and then both outsiders dump him. Uh, so Team Piper's completely out with that. So now there's all four NWO members left and Lex Luger, and they say it's five on one because they're including Rodman in with the count. Uh, So all of NWO kind of pose together, and they're celebrating, and they're beating Luger down who's in the corner, and then all of a sudden he makes a huge comeback, goes Mm -hmm. nuts with clotheslines, punches, uh, it's 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 similar to the World War Three finish, right, yeah. uh, but but it, it it works again. It's it's an amazing moment where he racks Savage. Savage taps out. He's gone. He clothesline Nash over the top rope. He's gone. He racks Hall. Hall taps out. He's gone. Crowd's going nuts. Tony's screaming at the top of his lungs. It's Luger versus Hogan. Nash tries to get back into the ring as Luger calls for the rack onto Hogan. He picks Hogan up. He's able to rack him. But Rodman hands Macho Man the can of spray paint, and then he kind of whacks Hogan with it. They say spray in the eyes, but I think it was supposed to be like a shot. Um, and and the way it works, it's actually like a fluke pin, but it looked pretty natural. Hogan's lands on top of Luger in the pinning position and wins uh, the match. And, uh, you know, a lot of times when somebody falls on top of someone, it doesn't look great. I, I thought it looked good here. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't know what to anticipate about this match from bell to bell, but I loved it. I thought it was chaotic. I thought it carried a good pace. I thought everybody looked strong in it, with maybe the exception of Mongo and Jarrett. But they're the lowest level guys here, so I didn't have that much of a problem with it, with that. I mean, they're they're they probably should be booked the least here, uh, honestly. Um, I thought all the eliminations were pretty smartly done. <laughs> the Rodman scene is. I mean, it's crazy to think about. I mean, he had a match. They had, they were in New Jersey. I looked up their schedule. They were in New Jersey on Friday night, and then they were in Atlanta on Saturday night. So he had back-to-back basketball games, then comes here for this, then has a game like Tuesday. I mean, we're in the middle of the NBA season. Right. And, uh, I mean, this would be, you know, like Travis Kelsey showing up at Niger. You know, I mean, it's just right. it's crazy. Or at Raw. It's a crazy thing to think about. Um, 
and it works. Him and Hogan's dynamic is great. Uh, this makes the NWO look strong, but makes Hogan look like a coward still. So he's kind of like your paper kind of figurehead that's a, being protected. Um, and so overall, I, I rewarded it with a, uh, uh, you know, I mean, when I closed my eyes, I, th- I thought it was a great match that I enjoyed. So I went four stars. <laughs> All right. It's definitely c- confusing. Um, I will say that. Even Buffer's confused and Hogan comes out like he doesn't know what's going on. Like I think I think this went like one step. It, it felt ECW-ish in that regard, whereas like maybe one or two things too many in the mix here. Like we should have simplified, I think, a little bit. I think adding Piper's team in the end hurt it. Um, I think they would have been better off adding Piper in for, for Rick and, and like have him at the show and he's – and they ask him to get, or they call him and say, oh, you're, he's going to be on Nitro, so he's in town, and they call him last minute. Because everything Piper-related in the buildup was was bad. And outside of Benoit, I don't think anyone shows up great like from his team. The Piper-Hogan stuff is good, and they could have done it the same if he was just on Team WCW. So they could have just had him on Team WCW, done the two teams, elimination-style fight, I think maybe draws it down a little bit, still keeps the engagement and the heat there without the extra bodies out there clustering it up. Um, because I do think that's one of the big problems. The over-the-top thing thrown at the last minute, again, is weird. It's like uh, it, the match, again, wasn't, I don't think, explained as thoroughly as it should have been. Because it does kill the buzz of the match. That giant goes over and kind of looks weak and getting eliminated. And he was so hot, and everyone is excited to see him. Taking him out of the match early, I thought, hurt things a little bit. Um, like you said, Mongo didn't look great. I do think Benoit looked awesome. I think he was probably the MVP um outside of luger i guess in the match to me at least on the whole face group side uh, i thought he really stood out and looked and they gave him a lot to do and they had him in there at the end um the nwo hangs on i'm fine with them winning obviously especially with the ridiculous tips uh they still they still shouldn't be giving in i know that's probably one of the complaints out there at the time but i'm fine with them still remaining strong here we're not that yeah. far in to where they should be losing yeah. major matches so I gave points for them for trying something new. Uh, they got all the stars out there. It was tough to follow again and, and dig into. Similar to World War III, I guess, in some ways. It, it was kind of hard to, to track. But um, the eliminations, too, I didn't think were structured that well either. Like, there wasn't much of a flow until the end where Luger just went, you know, ape shit and clean, clean house. I thought that was awesome. Rodman was great. The finish was memorable. We'll get to the post-match in a minute. Um, again, I dialed back two weeks ago, you know, the NWO winning, I'm fine with the booking decision. It's a little predictable. It makes Luke look like a fucking idiot yet again because he made this stupid deal where he gave up the tag titles to Bischoff, um, put themselves in this match where he knew the odds were going to be stacked against them. And even though the teams were even, they lost a guy going in. Rodman's out there fucking with them. The whole NWO army is on premises. So like, it, it just kind of makes him look a little dumb that they gave this whole – they gave up the whole boat um, for this. And again, another thing they get added is they can get a title match at any time. Like, did we say that wasn't an original step? So, the whole thing just is is kind of mismatched. I went three stars. I liked it. I like the Luger piece, um, but I do think there's enough messiness to keep it from being like a classic during this time. All right, uh, now we get to the finish. Which uh, post match, I'm gonna go out and say again. Uh, you know, been uh, been high, riding high on this show. Might as well go and say it. Um, I think what you think of the NWO angle and the whole feud as a, a totality, uh, what should be the peak moment is uh, Sting beating Hogan, Starcade. Um, and there's there's one moment, uh, it's it's Luger beating Hogan at the 100th Nitro that I think might uh, be comparable with this. But from a babyface side, um, I think this post-match angle is the best kind of angle, segment, whatever, uh, in the NWO stuff. There's memorable NWO stuff from their end, but from the babyface perspective, I think this is the top where, um, so, so they're clowning, they, they spray paint NWO on Luger, Rodman slaps him around. Um, and then they're kind of heading to the back and immediately Sting just like repels down right into the middle of the ring. Crowd erupts. Dusty yells, do something. Sting has the bat and immediately attacks the NWO to an insane pop. He hits Hall, hits Nash. Savage is on the top rope, comes down. He gets hit with the bat. 
uh, as he comes down with the double axe handle. Um, he then gives Savage the death drop after he whispers something, and then, you know, he's been talking to Savage. So there we go. Robin and Hogan are still in the aisle looking on. Uh, he gives the death drop to Hall and Nash. All hell's broken loose and uncensored, and Hell brought a baseball bat, which is that's a like an I, that's a line. top iconic Dusty line during the amazing, like that, that's amazing Dusty line. Uh, Tony says Sting finally shows a glimpse of what he's all about. Sting then points the bat at Hogan. Hogan looks like he's seen a ghost. Uh, Sting puts the bat down and tells Hogan to come on. Uh, Hogan goes to one side. Robin kind of retreats to the other. Sting turns his back uh, to him. And then when Hogan steps in, Sting gives him some punches, which Hogan takes a great bump over. Actually, he like, uh, does a complete flip on the bump off of Sting's punches. And uh, Sting gives Hogan the scorpion death drop as Tony's yelling, we got to go on commentary. So just an amazing baby face scene that we'd seen kind of the smoke screens from Sting at, uh, throughout all this where had he joined the NWO, had he not, etc. And uh, even even Bobby's all bored that we know one thing, he's not joining, he's not with the NWO. So And it was time. It was time to forward. make it was time to draw the line in the sand. Like enough of the back and forth with him. Let's get him on board. Not to say he's gonna be back in the ring, but let's at least like get that step out of the way. They needed a feel-good moment. It's an iconic moment of the Monday Wars in WCW in history. Um, everyone is, this is one thing I, I think everyone's going batshit about. I remember, uh, reading a lot of people losing it for how awesome it was when he comes down to Clean's house. I think I watched a show on scramble vision and I remember even like being super excited, listening to it, right. Dusty freaking out and Tony freaking out as Sting is cleaning house, finally take out a stance. And I'm shocked that they had Hogan get in the ring and take, take some offense from Sting. Like yeah. I'm really surprised they went that far with it, but yeah, this is an all time. All time WCW moment. It's it's fantastic. The crowd losing their shit, and Sting finally steps up for WCW, um, in the Queen's house. So it was really well done. That's it. We get to the credits, and uh, sh- there you go. All right, let's get to our awards here. Uh, match of the night. I ended up going uh, our opener, Guerrero Malenko. Yeah. To me, was was the best match. Yeah, I agree with that. All right. Best moment, I think we just talked about it, Sting cleaning house. Yeah, so I um, I kind of had a, uh, I, you know, it, to me this sort of sucks for DDP and yeah, Macho. Yeah, that Because that's an, an all-time angle, too. But uh, yeah, I went with Sting cleaning house, too. It's yeah, just, do it. that's like a top. Level. They're both top-level moments, for sure. Yeah. Um, all right, MVP, I, I went... I split. I went Sting and Luger because the Luger looked awesome at the end of the match. And the Sting is, I mean, that again, it's an all timer. Here's a, I went a little bit off the page and I wanted to give credit to that earlier angle. I went Savage. I thought Savage was amazing in that. He's really good in the match. He's a catalyst for a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Like he's a, he's a good, uh, you know, I like Giant and the NWO is like Hogan's buddy. But right. to me, like Savage is like the uh, number two to like Hogan's guy had a lot of legs. I don't think they what to see going forward, but I don't recall them to like together as much as they could have. Because I, right. I think there's some good kind of symbolic symbolism too that the WCW side could have played on and said like, Oh, well, you weren't man enough to beat him, so now you just had to be his lack. You know, like, you could have played that up right. and really went after Savage, that he's now protecting Hogan and all that. Um, I, I thought he was really great throughout the show. All right, we didn't have any shots fired that I picked up on. No. Um, even Piper, I don't think, worked any in his fucking rant. Um, mm-hmm. Debuts, we had uh, Mortis, Wrath, and Vandenberg. Is that it? Yeah. I think that was it. Yeah. And final grade. Rodman. I mean, did we do Rodman before? Well, we did Rodman last time. Yeah, I okay. think we had him on, on Nitro. Um, so despite our differences in grades <laughs> throughout the matches, I quite like the show. And even though with my grades being lower, it tells you how much I thought. I thought the booking was good. I thought the, the big moments delivered. Uh, the commentary is on point. I went, I went seven and a half out of ten, which still keeps it high, right? It is a high-performing WCW pay-per-view during the stretch of great pay-per-views that may be forgotten. Um, just a couple of things that really resonate with you just didn't fully click in the main event. I think 
if it's better explained and better flow to it, I think could have even hit even higher for me. But that said, the Sting and the Savage stuff carried a lot of weight for me. Plus, Benoit Guerrero was great. There's not a lot of fluff we cruised through. Um, but it's not like at that eight plus, which is where I have like Great American Bash and Bash at the Beach and all that stuff. Yeah, I have at that level. I'd like to watch Fall Brawl again uh, to see if I compare. Because, again, I think the main event and the war games are pretty similar just in the way the match was uh, worked and structured. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I'll die on the hill. This is a great show. I, I, I think it was. I, I I agree with the booking snap all, uh going in, but I, I think they really delivered. And um, just with the ending, I mean, you have so much entry coming out of it. So I went eight and a half. All right. I think that tracks with who we were and all the grades and stuff. So let us know what you think if you uh, check it out as well. Chad, we'll be back in two weeks. We'll be here with the fallout from this show and uh, more build to WrestleMania inside the war zone. Go home. It's, not the, it's, a, it's a go home. Yeah, all right. So we get to go home to Mania. So it's another big night uh, of Monday Night Wars action. I'll be here. And then a month from today, we'll be delivering to you WrestleMania 13. So, of course, that's a pretty iconic um, show in many ways, both good and bad. And it's uh, another tentpole match for us here on our journey. So. Yep. We'll be hitting that a month from today. Probably another show with a lot of divisive opinion, too. Yeah, so so sure. this is really a month for the <laughs> views. There's a lot of opinions you could have flying out there for both shows. I think it'll be an interesting uh, month, like combo awards, too, for the month for these two shows. It'll be some interesting right. stuff because there's some iconic moments on both, uh, for sure. All right, that's it. We're out of here. Smell the day, Palm. Talk to you in a couple weeks. Subscribe, YouTube, podcast apps. Social media, get it on everything. We'll talk to you soon. Take care.